good morning or good afternoon, I suppose now, although a running joke, I always say good morning. It always feels like before noon to me. First, I would like to acknowledge the four nations on whose traditional lands we live, work, and play. The Sinaiaks, the Shekwetnik, the Tanaha, and the Silks. This has been a difficult time for all of us, but John Horgan understands what people are going through right now. He has a plan to get people through the pandemic and build an economic recovery that works for everyone. As we recover from the pandemic, it's more important than ever that we invest in the technology that helps create new jobs while reducing carbon pollution. For 16 years, the BC Liberals gave tax breaks to the wealthy while failing workers and our environment. Now, Andrew Wilkinson is promising another tax break where the biggest benefits go to those at the top. John Horgan has different priorities. Instead of helping the people who need it the least, he's investing in our future. I'm proud of the progress John and his team have made, but there is a lot more to do. We need a strong government that is focused on people to guide us through the difficult road ahead and build a better future for all of us. John, thank you for coming to Revelstoke to share your vision with us. Take my ravi off. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole, and it's great to be here in Revelstoke. Uh, the, the weather couldn't keep us away, and what a spectacular afternoon we have this, the, to be here uh, in the traditional territory of the Tanaha, the Sinex, the Shrepmuk, and the Silks. It is uh, a real thrill to be here with our candidates in Columbia River Revelstoke. Uh, Nicole brings forward the values that all of us want to see in our government, someone who understands the small business sector and knows that the values that bring us all together working to lift up those who need help and then carrying on and doing the best we can under difficult situations is exactly what we need as we come through the pandemic. This has been a challenging time for all British Columbians and we're far from out of the woods. We've got a great distance to go and we need to focus on making sure that everything we do from this point on is focused on the people of British Columbia and the services that they need to keep them going. Whether it be more childcare, investing in K-12 education, or the ever important public health care system that defines who we are as Canadians and British Columbians. I believe Nicole will help us make that last step to have a stable, strong government going forward for the next four years so that we can deliver for the people of British Columbia and the people of Revelstoke and the Columbia Valley. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about issues. We've been talking about the things that matter to British Columbians. Earlier in the week, I announced 2,000 new spaces for STEM classes. That's science, engineering, technology, and math. Making sure that the innovators that we're going to need to meet the challenges of our future get the education they need and deserve today. Our government's been tackling these challenges for the past three years. And when we got here, I have to confess, there were problems just about under every rock. They were buried by the Liberals, ignored by the Liberals, and we've been doing our level best to bring these issues to light so British Columbians can understand the challenges we have going forward. Nowhere is that more evident than in the forest sector. The government didn't put the effort in, the BC Liberal government didn't put the effort in when the beetle kill came through to prepare for when that wood was gone. And instead it was all about more volume and not about more value. Our government has a different perspective. First, we put $69 million into a fund to protect those workers that were displaced when mills were closing because they didn't have access to fiber. But more importantly, we started putting in place a plan to ensure the fiber that we do have is used to make sure we're creating more jobs. On the coast, the big challenge is raw log exports. Where I come from, my rainforest, Nicole and I were talking about her rainforest and my rainforest, my rainforest is, was being cut down and exported raw to other jurisdictions to create jobs. Here in the interior, the BC Liberals ignored the downturn because of the beetle kill and instead just allowed mills to continue to harvest and cut and move volumes out. The softwood lumber agreement of course has had a profound impact on the industry and we need to be mindful every single day that our largest trading partner to the south of us doesn't look at our activity the same way we do. These are public forests. We know that. 
the public should benefit from them. And that's the focus we've had over the past three and a half years. But if we're going to continue to have a forest industry in British Columbia, it's a value proposition. And that's why I'm here to say that the mass timber industry, whether that be cross-laminated timber or other mechanisms to take our wood and add value to it, creating more jobs and creating environmentally sustainable building products is the way of the future. We've encouraged cities, and Nicole, as a, as a, a councillor and a member of the Union of BC Municipalities, knows full well that cities around British Columbia are standing up and saying, we want to build with mass timber. We want to use an environmentally focused building product to make sure that we are building the cities of the future and the province is helping as well. We've ensured that uh, buildings such as the, uh, the uh, student housing at BCIT is going to be built with mass timber fabricated here in British Columbia, manufactured here in British Columbia, put together by British Columbians. The uh, BC Archives are building a new building in lower, the Lower Island uh, in my community that will be built with mass timber. And companies are starting to make the transition as well. Kalashnikov Lumber in the South Kootenai in the Slocan, a generational business, three generations of people working in the forest sector, has made a significant investment, tens of millions of dollars, in transitioning away from volume and into value. And they will also be producing mass timber in the Kootenays, just as is being done right now in Okanagan Falls. And I want to talk a little bit about Structure Lamb, the company there. I've toured it several times. They are innovators. They, they made the proposition to me and to others that we can take our smaller dimensional lumber and create big lumber and make buildings that are all wood, mass timber. And they're not just doing it in British Columbia, they're exporting mass timber to the United States in huge volumes. That's the type of volume we want to talk about. Manufacturing jobs in British Columbia, sustaining our forest industry now and into the future, and building with a focus on climate action. If we use uh, wood products that sequester carbon, we're doing better, a better job to make sure that the buildings of today and tomorrow are going to be there to protect the youngsters that depend on a government that's focused on climate action. There's a lot going on in British Columbia. We've got challenges with COVID. We've got challenges with the opioid crisis. We've got challenges meeting the needs of British Columbians. We need to have a government that's focused on people. We need to have a member of the legislature from Columbia River Revelstoke that will go to Victoria, not to hear what Victoria has to say, but bring the issues of this community to the provincial government. And I can't wait to have Nicole sitting at the table with me in 20 one short day. So with that, uh, I want to thank you for your time this morning. I tried to yell as much as I could to those at the back, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions, Jen, that you may have on the line. Thanks very much. Two reporters on the line, please remember to press star one to queue if you have a question. If there are questions from reporters here, there is a microphone right here. Um, if you want to go ahead. And let's just see if there's anyone on the line. Hold on a sec. 10 o'clock press conference at 2 o'clock. That might do it. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to Tim Ford. Sorry. I'm getting the wrong information. This is going to happen. Oh. Gord Hoekstra. There we go. We're going to Gord. Oh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, just a, a question you mentioned about... Um, you know, uh, trying to make uh, the forest industry uh, more innovative and better. Uh, do you have any plans or proposals, that, you know, to do that? I mean, you mentioned some things that have happened already. What's going to happen going forward? Well, the first thing we did uh, this past summer was we appointed Ravi Kalon as the Parliamentary Secretary for Wood Innovation and Mass Timber. So we have a member of the government that's working with industry, uh, looking at best practices around the world. Uh, in my own community of Lankford, uh, we've had two mass timber buildings erected and the, and the wood was uh, had to be uh, contracted from Austria. It strikes me as slightly beyond odd that a forest dependent community like the one that I live in had to find mass timber in Europe. So we're looking to work with industry and the Kalashnikov example is a good one where long generational families have found a way to find investment opportunity to create more jobs and get more value out of our timber. The province is also leading by example when, our, when we do capital projects like hospitals, schools, the new St. Paul's in Vancouver will be a good portion of that will be built with mass timber. So we're making capital decisions with public dollars to make sure that our public forests are going to feed that, that new capital development. 
In, in addition to that, of course, we're going to be looking at other markets around the world, not just here in North America, but opportunities to export elsewhere. The Asian market is enormous for our wood products. We want to start selling more than just two by fours. We want to stop sending raw logs, certainly from my community. And that's, those are the innovations that we're talking about. A, re, a re, re-elected John Horgan government will focus on more value, less volume. Gord, do you have a follow-up? I do. Um, Ms. Versado has been quite critical about um, your party's uh, pledge on uh, net zero carbon emissions uh, in terms of, you know, there needs to be a plan to get there. What, what is that plan? Well, we made the announcement at Carbon Engineering in Squamish, uh, who, who are in the business of capturing carbon that's already in the environment and sequestering it. Uh, they have a, a pilot in, in Squamish. They have bigger plans uh, across North America. That's the innovation that we need to get to our 2050 targets. Uh, I appreciate uh, the work that we did with the Green Party Caucus to develop the Clean BC Climate Action Plan to reduce our emissions. The announcement we had yesterday was to take it to that next step. Not only do we want to see our emissions coming down by better building practices like building with mass timber, ensuring that we're giving opportunities to people to put in place uh, heat pumps to uh, uh, make sure that their homes are as energy efficient as possible, a whole range of other incentives to reduce emissions. But to get the emissions that are already in the atmosphere out, we need new technology. So again, I go back to the 2000 spaces for uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. We need to train the next generation of innovators who will get us, uh, that will unlock the challenges of the future. I, I, I'm not surprised that Ms. Persona wants an answer today about how we'll get to a target in 2050, but it strikes me the best way every journey begins with that first step. We need to train our next generation of engineers and scientists to get us there. That's our plan. Next, we're going to go to a question from Aaron. Yeah, John, we hear you've cut uh, provincial funding for Avalanche Canada this year. Uh, This Revelstoke-based service is important for the BC backcountry tourism industry across the province. Are you cutting funding? How much and why? Well, I I don't believe we are cutting funding, so I can't give you a how much and a why. If there is is a reduction in the budget, uh, I'll certainly get back to you on that, but that's not something I... uh, uh, on a, uh, sadly, on a beautiful day like today, we're not thinking about avalanches, but I know how critically important it is here in Revelstoke, and uh, we don't want to see any reduction in services for people who found them, find themselves in the backcountry in distress. So I'm not aware of that, uh, but I'll certainly look into it for you. Sure. Uh, another question. Uh, successive Revelstoke City Councils have requested that the provincial government reinstate a conservation officer here in Revelstoke. Many motions over the years asking for this. Uh, Do you have any plans or comments on not going forward? Last time I was in Revelstoke, I made my way through to Golden, where we do have conservation officers uh, uh, established. And I I agree with you. We need to increase the number. Part of the recovery plan that we announced in September looks at how we can make investments in people so that we can continue to provide the services uh, needed, not just in healthcare, education and other public services, but in in, uh, backcountry locations like this, having conservation officers to ensure that the interaction with wildlife is done safely and that uh, any actions that need to be taken or done by local officers is a good point. Uh, I know uh, Nicole will bring that to Victoria and we'll do what we can to address that budget as quickly as possible. Our next question is another one from here. Jocelyn, go ahead. Hi. um, Do you anticipate your new program with local BC logs will increase logging in the province? It will reduce the cut and cover uh, that's been going on over the past number of years and instead focus on sustainable harvesting and we'll put more value into the wood that we cut down. That'll extend the, the, the forest life. It'll allow, it's a, as, as you know, it's a renewable industry, tree planting. Uh, one of the uh, elements of our pandemic response that I'm most proud of is that we planted more trees this summer than we did last summer and we did it in a way that was safe. Uh, there were no interactions between those who come to plant trees in British Columbia and those communities that are affected by it. We need to plant more trees. Our plan is to make sure we can sustain our forest industry now and well into the future. And you do that by not just cutting as quickly as you can, which was the previous government's approach, but you do it thoughtfully. You make sure that when you put in place a cut block, those logs are going to be creating jobs, not just going somewhere else. Do you have a follow-up, Jocelyn? Yeah, and then how do you think that'll impact our old-growth forest, which isn't very much left in the province, as well as caribou habitat? 
we just uh, announced our response to an uh, old growth strategy. We, put, we asked two experts, uh, renowned British Columbians, to put in place an old growth plan. It involved uh, protecting 353,000 hectares of old growth forest. I might be off by a hectare or two on that in every corner of the province. Old growth forests are uh, critical to habitat. They're also critical to British Columbians. The, uh, the spiritual sustenance of many British Columbians is found in our old growth forests, and we want to make sure we maintain those into the future. I can certainly direct you to the plan and our response. It was just uh, last week or two weeks ago. I've kind of lost track of time. It was in September. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I'll get you the exact hectares, but old growth, uh, protecting old growth forests is an integral part of our government's plan going forward. Our next question from the phone is from Terry Theodore. Hi, uh, Sonia Bersman says that the, the best thing for the next government would be another minority government. I imagine you have a different idea on that. Well, we did accomplish a great deal in uh, three and a half years as a minority government, an unprecedented length of time in BC's history of having a minority government. But as I looked at the uh, challenges we have ahead, whether it be uh, another uh, 12 months of pandemic with respect to keeping people safe or uh, making sure that our recovery of the economy includes everybody, it's my view, uh, and I grappled with this, but I, I believe in my heart the best way forward is to have a secure and stable government. And that's why I'm asking British Columbians in every corner of the province, whether they've historically voted for the NDP or not, to support my candidate so that we can have a strong government that's focused on their needs, not more squabbling, not uh, another year. Uh, let's put the election behind us and let's focus on a sustainable, uh, strong, stable government to meet the needs of British Columbians. Terry, do you have a follow-up? I do, actually. I wanted to ask you about your platform. Um, I, I think the, the Greens and the Liberals are releasing theirs next week. Is that the same with you? And, and can you give me some highlights of uh, what might be in there? I bet there's be something about mass timber uh, just off the top. No, I, it will be uh, coming out next week, I'm fairly certain. Uh, I don't want to uh, give you a date, but uh, sometime next week. And it's going to be focusing on the needs of British Columbians. We want to make sure that we're focused on people, businesses and communities. That's the, the heart of British Columbia. All of those things have to be integrated together. And, and that's been our plan for the past three and a half years. And we want to continue that for the next four years. Our next question is from Penny Duflos. Oh, hi there. Um, a Green candidate has already stepped down to throw their support behind an independent. A lot of analysts are saying this independent actually has a really good chance of winning the seat in Chilliwack, Kent. And I just wonder, how would an independent uh, sitting in the legislature factor in for you? And is that something that you're kind of considering when you do the math about how this could all shake out? Well, certainly uh, what, what we're doing now is asking British Columbians... Uh, who they, where they want to go and who they want to lead them. And we are having 87 elections in British Columbia. There's one here in Columbia River, Revelstoke. Uh, there's one in uh, Kootenai East. There's one in Kootenai West. Uh, there's one in um, Chilliwack, Kent. And uh, the people in those communities will make the decision on who they want to elect, and they will arrive at the legislature, and then we'll get to work. I have... Uh, I've been uh, very comfortable working with uh, the Green Caucus. Uh, Mr. Weaver, Dr. Andrew Weaver, left the Green Caucus and sat as an independent, and uh, we continue to have a very good relationship. Uh, the Speaker of the Legislature, Daryl Plekis, was a Liberal, became an independent. And I've also, in, in, in the past three and a half years, been working with big businesses, small businesses, labor leaders, uh, not-for-profits, regular folks, indigenous leaders. I, I'd like to think that I bring people together. I'm, I'm delighted to uh, hope that my community re-elects me, and I look forward to meeting the next 86 members of the legislature and working with them, wherever they may come from and whatever perspective they may have. Penny, do you have a follow-up? No, I'm good. Thank you very much. Great. Our last question today is going to come from Nelson Bennett. Yeah, just uh, following up on um, um, Sonia Firstnell's um, uh, press conference earlier today, uh, and following up on um, LNG, she, you know, she mentioned the uh, the recent commitments to carbon neutrality and clean BC by um, uh, 2050. But she said, I think she cited a Stan Earth report that estimates that uh, because of LNG. Uh, BC will exceed its um, emissions budget by 160 uh, percent. That report doesn't specify how many plants we're talking about, but I'm just wondering if you could respond to that, basically saying we can't have LNG and meet, meet the targets. 
Well, I, I'm not I'm not aware of what Ms. Personeau said today. I've been uh, traveling uh, in out of cell range, but uh, I do know that our climate action plan was created with the Green Party Caucus. We worked with the BC Business Council to ensure that uh, industrial emitters understood that we needed to reduce emissions in that sector. We need to reduce emissions in transportation. We need to reduce emissions in our, ho our homes and our buildings. And we put in place plans with the Green Party Caucus to achieve those goals. The net neutrality we talked about uh, uh, yesterday is only going to happen if we invest in innovation and we have companies and, and young people who are doing the science and leading the way. I'm very confident in the next 30 years, we will. We, there are solutions we haven't even imagined yet. The best way to get those imaginations going is to create spaces for young people, get them into our post-secondary institutions and let them loose. Uh, I have every confidence that the next generation and the generation after that will be doing everything they can to have the same quality of life that all of us have had and, and they're going to do it better than we did and good for them. Nelson, do you have a follow-up? No, that's good. Thanks. Thanks, right. Nelson. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.